Hey guys, this is D Miles. We're uh, we're gonna wait a couple of minutes for more people to join, and we'll get started in shortly. I guess I can go ahead and do the introductions while we're waiting for other people to get on board. Um, I think I'll go in order of what we plan to do. Uh, so this is uh, first of all, thanks and uh, thanks for joining us today. Welcome. Uh, this uh, sort of webinar series is taking the place of the live seminar that we used to do years ago over at the um, Montgomery Civic Center. Um, this format seems to be very popular now. And uh, of course, with COVID, no one would uh, want to take the risk of gathering 1,500 people in a single place. So this is sort of our, our new venue for this, and, and I hope you enjoy it. So today we're going to talk about protecting consumers, uh, either from dangerous products or for from fraud and fraudulent schemes. Um, I'm going to introduce our panel in, in the order that you will hear from them. Um, I'm Dean Miles. I've been with the firm since the 91. And um, I think next in line that you'll hear from today will be from Allie Hawthorne. Allie's going to talk to you about um, AG cases. Allie's kind of a neat story. She started here as a law clerk, moved up to associate, and now she's a principal in our law firm. So she's started, her entire career has been here with Beasley Allie. We are uh, not only welcome uh, her here, but we, um, we're glad to have her and we're lucky to have her. Uh, next we'll be hearing from is Larry Golston. Um, Larry's going to talk to us about key TAMs mainly and some other things, how employment uh, cases relate to key TAMs. And then James Eubank is going to talk to us about securities. James, as some of you know, uh, used to work at the um, Alabama Securities Commission and now has joined us and is doing a variety of cases from, um, yeah, from securities to ERISA cases to just business disputes. So I'm going to kick things off today uh, by talking to you about class actions. I'm going to try to take about 12 minutes. Everybody will take about 12 minutes, and we'll try to get through this as soon as, as possible. So um, skip to the next one, Allie. So the next, uh, the very first thing I want to talk to you about is auto defect class actions. We're doing a lot of these. And the reason we started doing these was because there was, there's lots of uh, defects out there that are not getting addressed, or they're getting addressed through silent recalls, or only if you take your car in. Uh, they'll fix it, but you don't really know that they're fixing it. So um, we've had a number of these cases and a, a number of good successes uh, with these cases. And, and so the main thing when you're looking at these cases is you got to find a safety defect. It's got to be something that actually has causes a safety problem. This case that you're looking at here on the board is um, a Toyota case. Um, it involves fuel pumps. There is a part in a fuel pump called an impeller. Uh, it's a little round piece about this big around and it has grooves in it and, it and it goes around in a circle and actually causes the fuel pump to, um, to, to work the way it's supposed to work, which is to you know, spray fuel on, on the carburetor. This particular fuel pump, um, this uh, was made by a company called Denso. And uh, that impeller, when it was going through the manufacturing process, it was actually, we believe it was the drying process because it's a plastic piece. It didn't dry correctly. It had a slight warp in it, and then the, the um, impeller didn't work properly, and therefore the fuel pump didn't work properly. Well, as a result of that, uh, when you're driving down the highway, your fuel pump may malfunction, and you may actually come to a stall. There are several other scenarios in which it would cause safety products uh, problems. Um, sometimes the engine will thrust you know, back and forth like this, and, and then that could cause a rear-ended collision, or it could cause you to rear in some way. So safety is the first thing that you look for when you're looking at these. This particular defect here was in 3.36 um, million vehicles of Toyotas only. So naturally, when we had the case, we're thinking, okay, well, Toyota obviously wasn't the only manufacturer that had this problem. And sure enough, we found out Honda had the same problem. And you see that on here, Oliver versus Honda, that was filed in, in uh, the middle district, uh, I'm sorry, in the Northern district, uh, Judge Heikola has that case. And then there was a Subaru case that we filed with some friends of ours in New Jersey, uh, because that is where Subaru is located. And then we have uh, the last case we filed was Mazda, and we filed that in California. And so these cases are, are uh, if you see there, if you counted that up, you're, you're talking about almost 4 million vehicles that are out there with this defect. And so these are some of the things that we're doing. Uh, I wanted to just sort of give you an example of, uh, and, and you can see each one of these that, uh, like there's a million Hondas, there's 250,000 Subarus, only 200,000 Mazdas, but the 3.3 million in um, Toyotas is the lead case, and that case is carrying us down. Next, next case. So uh, another, next slide, Allie. 
Another one is uh, breaks. So this is uh, Paul Weedman. Uh, the plaintiff here is uh, Kyle Weedman's brother. Um, and Kyle Weedman is a lawyer here in Montgomery. And uh, he had a Ford uh, F-150 truck. It had a problem with his brakes. We looked into it. Uh, we discovered that there was a seal that was defective, called it, causing hydraulic pressure to be lost. And, and of course, that is a safety issue if you can't stop your vehicle. So that's one of the things we're doing here. This case um, actually was an easier case because you know brakes are uh, a system that are pretty easy to track through, through the car. And um, this um, master cylinder problem, um, we ac actually asked for to replace it. They uh, had done a recall earlier and all they did with the recall was to replace the old uh, master cylinder with another master cylinder of the same like kind. Well, that's not a good recall. So we challenged the recall in that case. And now we've gotten it to a point where they're all getting not only a new hydraulic system, um, they're getting uh, an entirely new seal and a new um, master cylinder, unlike the other one. Um, so that case actually has been certified by Judge Drain in Michigan. Um, and we are moving forward with that. And one thing I'll real quick I want to talk about, a lot of these cases that we filed two and three years ago, because it takes about five years for a, a, a class action to get to a point where you can settle it. Uh, there was a case called BMS out there that, that caused an issue with personal jurisdiction and basically said that you filed a case against a, a manufacturer in a class that you had to file it in the home state of the, of the company. We didn't believe that was the correct law, but we followed it for a while while we were filing these cases. So you're seeing some of these cases like, why did you file that in Eastern District of Michigan? That's the reason. You'd be happy to know that the 11th Circuit has said that is not a problem. And the 11th Circuit says in a class case, you do not have to file it in the home state of the defendant because it's not a personal jurisdiction issue. So that's the reason you see this. And I wanted to explain that real quick. Next slide. Um, here's another example of an auto defect. This is um, involving the, as you see up here, the sensor, the, the distance sensor in the car. And it was causing this car, it was defective. And it was causing this car to phantom brake just for no reason. We're driving down the road and it would start braking for no reason. And um, we have, you know, this is a very technical case that, that is actually going very well. We filed this one in Tennessee. Again, this was during the BMS era. Um, and uh, Nissan has uh, its place of business in Tennessee. This is another great case that um, we, we're looking forward to. It's not yet uh, certified, but, it, but it's, the certification is pending. So we're looking forward to that. Next case, I'm going to switch with you a little bit. Um, on the Blue Cross Blue Shield antitrust. This is another area of class actions that we're doing here. And this certainly is a consumer protection um, vehicle because what is happening here is there's two, there's actually two cases against Blue Cross. There's a, what we call a provider case and a subscriber case. The subscriber case is the case that involves people who own policies, which would be like me and you. Um, that case, part of the case is actually settled and it is before the court on a final approval. It has been preliminarily approved. Um, it's going for final approval, and it was a very large settlement. It was $2.67 billion. Now, we were not part of that because we were on the other side of the case. We, our firm represents the doctors and the hospitals, um, and the problem they had was that Blue Cross had such a monopoly, because when you hear antitrust, the first thing you think of is, oh, they price fixing. That's exactly what they do. And when you have a monopoly, you basically can tell people what your prices are going to be. And that's what happened with the doctors here in the hospitals. Blue Cross with such large market power basically told hospitals and doctors, this is what your rate's going to be. And they were telling them exactly how much they were going to get. And there was no bargaining power. Well, that's against the law. You should be able to have some bargaining power in the marketplace. It should be a fair and free market. That's what this case is essentially about. The provider side of the case is not settled yet. Um, it is pending before Judge Proctor in Birmingham. There are 38 different Blue Cross Blue Shield um, uh, plans before Judge Proctor throughout the country. And we believe that there will be a resolution of that case one day or a trial. Um, but we um, are looking forward to have that case come in to hopefully either one of those. And it'll be a good result for the doctors, the hospitals, and also the subscribers, which have already gotten some relief. Those quickly are some of the things that we're doing um, on the class action level and also the trust level. We'll talk to you at the end about insurance, but um, that's gonna be mainly um, involving class actions and I'll hold that. So Allie is next. And I think Allie's gonna talk to us about what we're doing with the attorney general business. So Allie, you have the floor. Thank you, Jeff. Um, 
Sure, thank you, Dee. You know, in many instances, we're looking at these type of consumer cases um, from a class action standpoint, or even an MDL, especially when it comes to pharmaceutical products. But what our firm has been very successful in doing is looking at these cases from, uh, from another angle. And that would include this uh, representing states and other municipalities and self-funded healthcare plans. Um, state attorney generals as the chief legal officer of the state can file a lawsuit. Um, and in many instances, we have been retained as outside counsel to represent the state with that lawsuit. And the same with municipalities. When, when municipalities have standing to file a lawsuit, we can be hired um, as outside counsel to um, assist those municipalities with their lawsuits. And the same is true for these self-funded healthcare plans. Um, and one fact that is often overlooked is that the state and local governments like individuals are consumers of goods and services. And so any time, anytime there's some type of unlawful or deceptive conduct that's occurring with respect to consumers, a state or municipality very well may have a claim as well. And that includes goods such as pharmaceutical products. And I'm sure it's not a surprise to anyone that the pharmaceutical industry is rampant with fraud and state and local governments spend billions of dollars um, in prescription drugs. So we find ourselves focusing a lot of our attorney general practice on um, the pharmaceutical industry and claims regarding uh, prescription drugs. And so looking at some of the attorney general cases that we have handled in the past, um, we've handled a lot of cases involving anti-competitive arrangements between drug manufacturers. We have investigated on behalf of states claims where a brand manufacturer may pay off a generic manufacturer um, to keep lower price drugs out of the market. We've handled um, a great number of price fixing cases. We've represented a large number of attorney generals in cases regarding the fraudulent reporting of drug prices that where drug manufacturers are reporting inflated prices um, in order to increase their market share for those drugs. We've handled cases on behalf of state AGs where major chain pharmacies have reported artificially inflated high prices for their prescription drugs in order to increase the amount that the states are reimbursing for these major chain pharmacies for each of those transactions. Um, we've handled a great number of cases for states involving the fraudulent reporting of the status of a particular drug, um, where drug manufacturers have, um, have broken the rules and put a drug on the market that never had FDA approval, and the states were paying you know, millions of dollars um, in reimbursements for these drugs that should have never been on the market. We've also handled claims regarding fraudulent reporting of safety and um, efficacy information. Um, and we've investigated claims regarding unlawful retention of rebates and recoupments, which is a big area um, in PBM litigation or pharmacy benefit litigation. Um, we find that a lot of our PBM uh, investigations pertain to potential claims that municipalities and other self-funded health plans may have. Um, you'll notice that there are three major PBMs um, and those three major PBMs have 77% of total market share. And those top three PBMs process over three quarters of total prescription claims. So it is a very, very concentrated market. And what a PBM is, or a pharmacy benefit manager, what they are, they're the middleman between the drug maker, the pharmacy, and the health plan. And what's, what we're seeing happening and what we're investigating into are instances where these major PBMs are capitalizing on this concentrated market and the lack of transparency that comes with that. And they're committing unfair practices with respect to their drug pricing, which keeps healthcare costs high, with respect to their drug formularies and their approved drug lists, with respect to their rebates and their recoupments, and various other issues that we're seeing PBMs committing that are causing um, municipalities, states, and other self-funded healthcare programs, which oftentimes are the states to the extent that a state offers health benefits to its, um, 
to its state employees. And we're saying that these PBM practices are causing a great deal of harm um, to all those potential clients. Some of the major areas that we're seeing with respect to PBM litigation involve um, rebates. What we're seeing is where a pharmacy benefit manager um, under a certain contract would be required if they get any type of rebate on a drug to then pass on that rebate, pass that on to the plan. And the goal there is to lower the um, drug costs for the plan, which ultimately lowers it for the consumers. But what we're seeing is these PBMs are retaining, unlawfully retaining those rebates and pocketing it as, their pro as, as profit um, instead of passing those rebates on. Um, we're seeing that PBMs are getting away with this by couching the retained rebates as a, as a um, non-disclosed, um, some type of administrative fee or a hidden fee, when in fact, it's just purely them retaining a rebate that they should have passed on to the plan. Uh, we've also investigated claims where PBMs are committing unlawful practices with respect to their uh, recoupment practices and their clawbacks, where uh, we're seeing this has significant effect, not only on the states, but also independent pharmacies where the uh, PBM will reimburse for a particular claim. After the claim is fully adjudicated and the books are closed on that claim, the PBM then comes back to the pharmacy and claws back or recoups a portion of that payment, which is can be extremely devastating for a lot of these independent pharmacies who, on, who in many cases are taking a loss for that transaction after the clawback occurs. Um, while these may be the two big areas that we've handled investigations, we're interested in looking at various other practices that we know that PBMs are committing, at least the major PBMs. Um, we know that there are anti-competitive practices and unlawful practices with respect to the PBM drug formularies, um, where PBMs are incentivized by drug manufacturers to put higher priced drugs on their formularies because the PBM in turn gets a, claw, gets a, a rebate from the drug manufacturers. So instead of the PBM putting lower price drugs on their formulary or drugs that are actually more effective, they're in fact putting higher price drugs on their formularies to increase their own pro profits through the rebate process from a drug manufacturer. Uh, we're seeing a lot of instances where PBMs are committing um, unlawful practices where they're reimbursing pharmacies at unreasonably low rates. Uh, we're seeing PBMs engage in spread pricing where PBMs are actually uh, reimbursing a pharmacy at a lower price, often a generic drug price, but charging the health plan a much higher price, which is also which is usually the brand drug price. And that difference between the, the lower price that they reimburse the pharmacy and the higher price that they charge the plan is a spread and it's pure profit for uh, the PBM. So we're interested in investigating and have been following all the various uh, practices that PBMs have been committing that, um, that harm states, municipalities, and any other type of self-funded health plan uh, that we may be representing. So, Alan, we've got a couple of extra minutes on your topic. Um, one of the things that I'm, I know you and I see oftentimes is that we'll get um, a case in and we start investigating it and we'll see, well, there's an arbitration clause there's a class waiver clause. And you can't bring that as a class one and two, you don't wanna bring it as an individual arbitration case because it's just not that, you know, it's not almost worth not doing. So we, we have looked at, I believe you and I have on numerous occasions at bringing a case on behalf of consumers through the attorney general because arbitration doesn't apply in that, in that scenario. Is that right? That's right, and that's one, um... Benefit. I get asked a lot as far as what are the benefits of bringing these AG claims, and that's in fact one of them. You know, the the arbitration clause is not binding in an attorney general lawsuit, um, and so it's definitely one good you know attractive feature of bringing these claims on, on behalf of the attorney general's office, on whether it's to recover state funds or in a parents patriotic capacity where the state is stepping in the shoes of its citizens and trying to you know put an end to some type of unfair deceptive practice. Um, some, in addition to not being exposed to the arbitration um, clauses, there are various causes of action um, and remedies that make these AG claims very attractive. Most states have consumer protection or unfair deceptive trade practices act statutes um, that actually provide express standing for attorney generals to file suit. 
That's the same for um, many states have specific Medicaid fraud statutes or state specific false claims act statutes, as well as antitrust um, statutes for a particular state. And so all of these statutory claims can be very powerful uh, when you're bringing a case on behalf of the, of the attorney general's office. Of course, there's common law claims that are also available. We see most common the breach of contract claim. Uh, if a provider is going to be providing health care within the state, especially through the Medicaid program, they have a contract with the Medicaid program. If a PBM is processing claims for a plan or for a Medicaid agency, they also have a contract. So we do see that the common law claims um, are viable claims as well. But it's really these statutory causes of action and the available remedies that really make these type of attorney general cases um, attractive. Um, many of the consumer protection statutes and, and some of the Medicaid fraud statutes allow for civil penalty uh, per violation. And so when you're talking about prescription drug claims and you're talking about millions of prescription drug claims, obviously those violations really add up and the civil penalty is a great tool afforded to attorney general uh, litigation. Uh, a disgorgement of profits is available to AGs in some states, as well as, of course, compensatory damages and injunction. When, when um, a company is coming in and committing fraud on a statewide basis, the injunction is a powerful tool to actually make a difference on a statewide and national uh, basis as well. And, of course, the investigative tool of civil investigative demands is unique to attorney general litigation and it provides for the attorney general to be able to investigate these claims pre-suit if that would be something valuable for that particular case. So there's definitely an attraction to handling these cases on behalf of AGs, municipalities, and even you know, self-funded health plans that may be through the Attorney General's office as well. Um, and so before we turn it over um, and turn it over to Larry, I just kind of want to end it with, you know, I get the question a lot or the concern that. You know, I, I don't do a whole lot of um, this type of litigation, or I don't have contacts with AGs. And I just want to remind everybody that any type of case that you may be aware of where consumers are affected by some type of statewide or nationwide type of claim, feel free to call me. I'm happy to talk with you about it because it very well may be a claim that we could bring on behalf of a state or a municipality. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, at the end of this panel as well, as far as what type of cases we're seeing and what could be viable claims for um, attorney generals. Thanks, Allie. Larry, I see out there that um, there's civil penalties. That's one of your favorite things to talk about with whistleblower cases. You want to talk to us about whistleblower cases and what's going on with you on those and maybe even some of your recent successes because you've had a few. Yeah, so the the False Claims Act is a statute that we uh, use a lot uh, in our practice. And the False Claims Act was actually a very interesting statute, a powerful statute uh, for plaintiff's lawyers. It is a statute that was uh, enacted back in 1863 by President Lincoln. Uh, at the time, the, the purpose of the statute was to combat profiteering by uh, defense contractors that were doing business with the Union Army. And over the, the centuries, the statute has become the number one weapon uh, used by the federal government to recoup its losses due to fraud, ab abuse, and waste. And essentially what the statute does is it prohibits and outlaws anyone doing business with the government from defrauding the government. And the way it, it goes about combating the, the huge problem of fraud against the federal government is it gives private citizens the right to bring a suit called a KETAM suit. And essentially it gives that, that private citizen the right to stand in the shoes of the government and prosecute claims of fraud against the government. The, the intricacies, intricacies of, the, of the statute uh, cause people to, to get in trouble sometimes when they try to file them without really knowing the ins and outs of the statute. Two of the big ins and outs are you have to be the first person to file the suit. There's a first to file provision that says, hey, whoever meets the, the, the criteria of getting to the courthouse first and getting this suit filed first is gonna be the individual that the, the law will allow to proceed with the claim. When you file the suit, it has to be filed under seal uh, and, it, and it has to remain under seal while the government is given an opportunity to investigate the claim. The government can choose 
after he has done a, a thorough investigation or an investigation that it deems thorough enough, the government can choose to either intervene in action or decline intervention. If the government were to intervene in the case, the relator, the whistleblower, uh, stands to recover 15 to 25 percent of whatever the government recovers in the case. If the government declines to intervene, the relator can prosecute the claim on their own through his or her lawyers, and they stand to get 25 to 30 percent of the claims. Um, a lot of people think, well, isn't it a good idea to then not let the government intervene? Can we dissuade the government intervening and, and just go on our own? And that, that would seem reasonable, but actually the, the statistics bear out that more than 90% of the claims are successfully resolved when the government does intervene. So you might get a smaller share of the overall recovery, but you got a 95, 96% chance of actually recovering something if the government intervenes. That number drops all the way down to like 10 or less percent, like 10 to 9% when the government doesn't intervene. And, and primarily the reasons are because you have to have a lot of resources to be able to prosecute these claims on your own. Uh, we, we've prosecuted several on our own and, and done well, but you gotta have the resources and you gotta have the time and, and to gather the evidence and go forward with it on, on your own. Uh, another quirk in the statute is there's, there's something called a public disclosure bar. So you can't bring a False Claims Act lawsuit on any issue that's already been publicly disclosed through the media, through government investigations, through uh, congressional reports and things of that nature. However, the, ex the exception to the public disclosure bar is if your client, if the whistleblower that is the, the person who brought this to the government's attention in the first place, if they are the original source of that information that is publicly disclosed, then you can still bring a private lawsuit. And, and as the, the PowerPoint shows, in these cases, the whistleblower, the plaintiff is, is known as the relator. They're the person who, who stands in the shoes of the government and prosecutes those claims. And as Dee was mentioning, this, this statute is very powerful because not only does the government recover the amount of money that it has paid out due to fraud, which usually is substantial in most government contract cases, they get to treble those damages. So if you end up, let's say, on a smaller end of things, in a lot of these cases, you're at seven figures. So if you end up with a, a seven-figure case, a million-dollar case, you prove the claims, you're going to get at least $3 million back. And Larry, then, and Larry, can you explain, that's not discretionary. Yeah, that's not discretionary. That's mandatory. So once you prove the claim, you prove that the government was defrauded, you put your damages on and you say, hey, the government paid out $5 million that they shouldn't have paid out due to this fraud. Well, by law, the judge has no discretion. They're going to get $15 million back in the government coffers and the treasury because of that. And then here's where the, the statute is just ultra powerful. The, the, the statute also mandates and requires a civil penalty for every instance of fraud. And the current iteration of the statute says that is a minimum of $11,463 up to $22,927. So you can do the math on your own, but that is that will take a normal seven-figure case and turn into eight or nine figures. Because what happens is, I'll give you a perfect example. We tried a case uh, a few years back where the Alabama Organ Center was being uh, defrauded by one of its contracts. And Alabama Organ Center receives federal funds from the Department of uh, Human Health and Services, which is CMS. And so what this guy was doing, he was essentially uh, fraudulently billing the government by, by padding his bills and, and claiming to have done more work than he actually did, for lack of a, a better explanation. And so what he and his co-conspirators would do, they would meet at his place of business and they would come up with how much they should pad the bill. Okay, they would literally conspire on how much we should increase these bill amounts about. Then he would turn around and he would put that into an invoice form and invoice the government. All right. Then the government would actually submit payment back to him for those inflated prices. So right there, you had three different sets of penalties. You had in, under our conspiracy claim that we brought, you had these guys meeting and conferring 
to inflate these prices, right? So each time they did that, that was a penalty of 11,463 to 22,927. Then they would actually inflate the, the bill, the invoices. So there's a one of the claims of the statute is it is illegal to use a record or statement to assist you in defrauding the government. So those invoices became a record or statement. So now you have for the same transaction or scheme, you have another set of penalties for each time they inflated the invoices. And then when he submitted the invoices, the number one claim under the statute is it is illegal to fraudulently or falsely present a false claim to the government. So there on the third leg of that tripod, you had penalties for each time he actually submitted the claim to the government. So it ended up being just, you know, when you calculated all those penalties plus the damage to the government, you, you took a seven figure case and turned it to high eight figures, you know, just like that. Uh, in addition to treble damages, in addition to the civil penalties, they have to pay interest on the damages uh, and they have to pay attorney's fees, costs and expenses. And, and now the, the treble damages, as I mentioned a minute ago, that's just on the actual damage the government sustained. You can't trouble the penalties, but you really don't have, you really don't need to trouble the penalties because as I just pointed out in that illustration, different acts in the fraudulent scheme will result or yield different sets of penalties that will be, you know, that can be voluminous uh, in a given case. Uh, some of, if you go to the next slide, Ali, there, there, there are several different, because the federal government is so huge, right? There are several different legal theories you can pursue in a key TAM case. I'm going to go over a few of them. Uh, you mostly, you know, in today's world we live in, some of the uh, driving false claims that cases you're going to hear about will be in the, the healthcare sector. And so there are a lot of different theories and claims in healthcare. And, and here's a few of them. Uh, fraudulent healthcare billing, right? You have claims for services not actually performed. That's pretty self-explanatory. That typically happens where a medical provider will bill Medicare and say they performed a certain procedure and just didn't do that procedure at all. They may have done other procedures, but they didn't do the procedure that was billed for. Claims for services not medically necessary. Routinely, medical providers are required to certify to the government that the service that they provide to a patient such as tests or physical therapy, things of that nature, are medically necessary because under CMS's uh, Medicare, Medicaid's guidelines and regulations, they will only reimburse for costs that are, are reasonable and necessary. And so a, a lot of times you'll have, you know, unscrupulous medical providers who would just do a service so they could build Medicare for it, but it was really not a necessary service. Claims for misrepresenting the provider service. This is a routine common thing, you'll have a uh, nurse practitioner perform a service, but then that service is billed by the doctor. Or you'll have uh, a general practitioner do a service, but then the specialist who can bill for reimbursement at a higher rate will bill under their CPT code, and that, that's fraud against the government. Uh, upcoding for services is another common one you see. That's just billing for services that weren't provided as delivered or sold. So there was a service provided, unlike for claims for, for services that are not actually performed, a service was performed, they just bill for a code that they know Medicare will reimburse at a higher rate for. Uh, unbundling, this is, this is another common and tricky one. Uh, in the healthcare industry, there are certain procedures and services that are automatically <coughs> performed as a group. And Medicare regulations say that they have to be bundled together. But what some doctors and providers have figured out they will bill for the bundled services, and then they will go in and pull out a service and bill for that specific service as well. And so essentially you, you have double dipping. You have the provider billing for two different services that were actually only performed once. Um, you also have false cost reports. You usually see false cost reports as a part of a hospital or nursing home or some home health facilities because M Medicare Part A requires those types of facilities to do cost reports annually. And you have to certify that your cost reports are accurate and are truthful. And people go in, like the example I gave, and they pad their costs to try to inflate their costs. And then when they submit that to Medicare, they've automatically certified that they're telling the truth when they're not. So those are big violations. What we typically see and kind of the cases we like to see 
are Stark Act and anti-kickback statute violations, AKS violations. The Stark Act prohibits a physician or a physician's family member from referring a patient to a provider uh, who provides designated health care services. And it prohibits those, those physicians or their health, uh, family members from doing that if the family member or the physician would get some type of direct or indirect uh, financial relationship from the provider. So what is that in real life? That's where you have a doctor who has his own medical practice or her own medical practice, and then they've gone out and partnered with somebody who, let's say, does imaging, right? They do diagnostic imaging, uh, like CT scans or whatever. And they have a private LLC that does that. Well, it is illegal for that for the doctor in his or her medical practice to refer patients to that imaging company for imaging because they have a financial stake in the imaging company. And we see that a lot because the 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 component of the, of the statute that gets people tripped up is your family members can also not be a part of the company that does the referral business. And so some doctors will go out and have their wife or their children, they're in a, a business. It, it could be a janitorial service, right? They'll start a janitorial service. They're doing all these, these uh, janitorial services for different people in the office suite. Well, they can't, you can't refer that company to the medical practice because that would violate Star Cat. And our kickback statute is another common one because the anti-kickback statute basically makes it illegal for a physician to offer or pay any remuneration is what the statute says uh, for referrals to that physician's practice. And the statute defines remuneration as anything of value. We had a case that we successfully settled down in Mobile, Alabama, where what this doctor was doing, he was in a uh, ENT practice and it was highly competitive practice. And what he was doing, he was going to the people who in the, the medical practice who it, it did the intake for the patients. And he would offer them like, you know, monetary cash, you know, gifts or gift cards if they were still all people who came into the practice that walked in the door to him. So as the patients came in, those people had an incentive instead of the, the sending the Dr. Golston, to send them to Dr. Miles because He's out there paying them, you know, under the table to do that. And that's a no-no. Um, another, you go to the next slide, Allie. Another big area of these uh, false claims that we see is in the area of defense and homeland security contracts. Uh, again, that's, that's kind of the, the foundational uh, area of the government where this statute was born. And we still see that today. Um, some of the theories we see there is like product substitution, right? A lot of defense or DOD contracts and homeland security contracts require the contractor use certain products or parts or use certain products or parts of a particular quality or type. Uh, we recently had a case where there was a DOD contract that required that a certain type of metal is used in a product and the contractor was using a, a inferior or substandard metal. So that turned out to be a false claims that case. You see it a lot of times where uh, there are a lot of statutes like Buy America Act that says, hey, you have to use a uh, product made by, made in this country or a product made by an American company. And defense contractors find it cheaper to go overseas to places like China or you know, uh, Eastern European countries to get those products. And that results in a false claim viol act violation. Mischarging and cross-charging, those are other common fraud theories. Mischarging is, is simply uh, where you see um, contractors will inflate their bill to the government by charging labor, parts, or other costs that are not actually incurred. So it's just, you know, you garden variety fraud. We, we, we pad our bills and say, hey, we did these work, these things, and we did do them, but we, we just charge your inflated price. Cross-charging is where they take their employees or they take parts or labor from a different project and they use it on your project and they bill you for that, that work. And so that's fraudulent as well. Uh, failure to test and ins or inspect. In fact, th this is ironic. We actually have a case, a DOD Homeland Security type of case, where we just got a significant ruling in on yesterday. And that case involved a failure to inspect. Uh, it's a case where a uh, company is hired by the Department of Defense to inspect aircraft at uh, Fort Rucker here in Alabama and the company was 
skipping the required mandatory steps for inspection and maintenance. And that's really dangerous because a lot of you may know at Fort Rucker, the, the young people there that are flying those aircraft, they're training to be pilots. They're not experienced pilots. They're down and they, they basically just got a boot camp and they're learning to fly. And this company has this contract to inspect this aircraft and they are, they are doing a very substantial job and putting people's lives at risk. So failure to test, failure to inspect at the contract and the, and the federal regulations require results in the false claims act yeah. cases. Larry, we need to we need to go to James. Can you wrap wrap up these last three? Yeah, the last three I'll, I'll talk about real quick. They're kind of all similar: substandard products or services uh, and general procurement. Those are just cases where you have products that don't meet the, the requisite specifications called for by the, the contract and general procurement the same way. The federal acquisition regulations call for certain um, steps to be taken when you hire contractors. And a lot of times people give, you know, backroom deals to contractors who are not qualified to do the work. And those ends up being false claims that violations. Real quick before we turn it over to James, one thing that people ask, as Ali was pointing out, you know, how do you come about these cases? And you typically come about them in the employment arena. I, I do employment discrimination cases as well, and usually you want to ask if a person comes in your office and they have an employment case, you want to ask, do they work for a company that does business with the government? Because usually those people know about the fraudulent and, and, and uh, misgregious conduct going on at the, at the government level. Thanks, Larry. That was a good job. So uh, the whistleblower program is not unique to just government contracts, uh, James. It's also, you see it a lot in the securities realm. Can you talk to us about that? Sure. Yeah, the, the SEC whistleblower program is was set up by the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act in 2011. Uh, and it provides incentives to whistleblowers uh, in securities fraud situations specifically. Now, these can kind of bleed over with a lot of the things that may also be a false claim act case, like uh, anything where they're padding or altering the financials to try and get more money out of the government, if they're reporting financials publicly, that can also be a securities fraud action as well. Uh, the reward, like False Claims Act, is for original information that has to lead to a successful enforcement action for securities fraud. Um, a key difference between this and, and typical key TAM cases is that instead of the relator filing a suit under seal and then the government deciding whether to pick it up, uh, SEC whistleblower will go directly to the SEC whistleblowers program, talk with them, with their attorney, and then the SEC actually invest, finishes investigating, relies on the substantial assistment, assistance of the whistleblower, and then they file the action when they feel it's time to do it. Uh, the, the relator share, the whistleblower, is entitled to 10 to 30 percent of the monetary sanctions that are collected. It's not just the award, it's the things that are actually collected through the action, judgment, or other settlement. Um, there's a 30% presumption for awards that are under $5 million, and that's most cases. That's not the ones that make the headlines, but that's your, your average case is going to be in that area. Um, the monetary sanctions, although they don't provide for an attorney fee award, the monetary sanctions include penalties, disgorgement, and interest uh, that the SEC collects. And there are also protections in the whistleblower program for uh, whistleblowers in, in terms of facing retaliatory action from their from the company that they report. Go to the next slide. So the SEC issued its annual report in 2021, and it really showed how, how far the whistleblower program has come and how much it's taken off recently. Uh, in total, since it began in 2011, there's been almost $5 billion in monetary sanctions that have been collected. And 1.3 billion of that was paid directly back to investors. The rest of it was in penalties and, and disgorgement. Uh, in, <clears throat> excuse me, since 2011, 1.1 billion has been awarded to whistleblowers. There've been 214 people who've gotten awards. 2020 was a record year. 175 million was paid out to whistleblowers, but then 2021 last year absolutely dwarfed it with 
over a half a billion dollars awarded to 108 whistleblowers. Some of these were large awards to single whistleblowers. Um, there was a $114 million award to two whistleblowers in September of 2021, and $110 million of that went to one individual based on a case that the SEC brought and a related action brought by another agency. So even if the SEC doesn't pick up the action, if the DOJ were to take it up and prosecute somebody criminally for fraud, you could still uh, successfully prosecute them and get an award. You could still try and get, uh, you can still apply to the whistleblower program, excuse me, for that 10 to 30%. Um, you don't have to be an insider to get these awards either. There have been several awards, some of them rather large, for somebody who's provided substantial assistance but wasn't on the inside of the company. Uh, a lot of these people are either certified fraud examiners or CPAs that examine the books and detect the financial fraud in the reporting by the companies. Uh, the key thing is just that it's original information and that it substantially aids the SEC. And there are some proposed rule changes on the awards as well that were just proposed in February that state the, the amount of the award can be, as it is now, the amount of the award can be considered by the SEC when they decide where you're gonna fall in that 10 to 30% range. Well, the new rule is gonna specify that they can only consider the amount of the award when they're deciding to increase it. They cannot decrease your award based on the fact that it's gonna be a big award. So that's, that's gonna better incentive, incentivize whistleblowers to come forward. Uh, this is what people typically think of in securities litigation is securities fraud class actions. They're going to be based on inadequate disclosures, outright lies of a publicly traded company. And the fraud on the market that I have there in quotes is the theory that markets are well informed and operate uh, properly based on the disclosures that come out either in press releases in companies' financial statements and in news reports. So the stock price that you see on the ticker in the morning is an, um, an amalgam, a collection of all that information and its impact on the company. So if they're putting out false financial statements or lies to the public uh, saying that they've got better business prospects than they really do, that's going to affect the stock price on the ticker, which means every person in the country who buys that stock is affected. And so that's what a fraud on the market is. Uh, the Public Securities Litigation Reform Act and uh, SELUSA, which was later passed, make federal court and federal law the only game in town for these types of litigation when it's a publicly traded company that's on something like the NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, first started with heightened pleading standards. It's got to be pled, the false statements have to be pled with particularity, and it's got to create a strong inference of, of, scienter, of scienter, excuse me, knowledge on the part of the company. It's got to allege actual causation too, and that's one of the big issues that leads to a lot of expert work, especially uh, in what's going on in the market and in that sector beyond the fraud, because you've got to show not just that the stock price dropped, but that the stock price dropped because of the misstatements or omissions made by the company. And then Salusa narrowed this a little bit further and stated that any covered class action over a covered security has to be brought in federal court and has to use federal securities law. So state court and state securities violations cannot be used if, you know, say Google committed securities fraud, you have to go to federal court because they are a publicly traded company, so they're a covered security. Beyond um, securities litigation, and one more thing I'll add on that too, one of the growing areas in securities fraud litigation is SPACs. If people don't know what these are, these are special purpose acquisition companies. And the way I'll think is the best way for people to visualize it is to think about a company that doesn't have any business. They've just got a big pile of cash. It's just a pile of cash wrapped up in a corporate entity. So they'll find another business that wants to go public, but doesn't want to deal with all the regulations, red tape, and the disclosures that you have to do in order to do an IPO. This uh, SPAC will purchase that company 
and merge the two. And then instead of doing an IPO for the actual business, they go public because the SPAC already has a ticker symbol and they can do it with far less disclosures. And this has been a subject of a big increase in litigation lately. And the SEC has actually proposed some new rules that will increase disclosures required when an SPAC takes a company public through that merger instead of by doing an IPO. Um, we handle more than securities obviously here, but we handle a lot of business litigation as well. Breach of fiduciary duty and derivative actions, uh, shareholder squeeze out are kind of securities related, but we go beyond that. We do breach of contract, fraud and misrepresentation, uh, partnership disputes, tortious interference and, and accounting and business valuation malpractice. A lot of uh, what we've done as well involves misrepresentations in the purchase and sale of, of equipment. A lot of businesses, even small businesses, rely on some pretty pricey equip equipment costing in the hundreds of thousands, even millions of dollars. And if it's represented when they're shopping for this equipment, that it will perform, perform a certain task or do a certain thing, but then it doesn't live up to that. And the person who sold it knew it wasn't fit for that at the time, then you can have a fraud misrepresentation claim. And things like that can be fatal to a small business. If they invest that much capital and then it doesn't produce for them, you can quickly run into overhead problems and cash flow problems in a business. And we've got a couple of cases that I've worked on. One's already resolved, one is still pending, involving uh, you know, six figure pieces of equipment that they were told, yes, this will do the job, this will do what you want it to do, but it was totally inadequate for the, for the purpose that they bought it. Thanks, James. I'll real quickly, Allie, run through um, these insurance settlements and then we can take questions. This is something that we recently settled. This is uh, one settlement here with Banner and William Penn. There were two together, but we still do a lot of insurance litigation, um, not as much on the class level, but we still take bad faith cases. We still work on those. We still take a lot of the, uh, of the individual cases that have to do with life insurance policies where they just didn't pay properly. Or a lot of times I cancel you right before the death. Uh, we're working on one of those right now. But this case here involved a, what we call a COI increase, which is a cost of insurance increase. And essentially, this is what happened. Uh, interest rates were down over the last pro probably eight years. And insurance companies, um, when they take your premium and invest it, they take a spread between the um, what you give them and what they get in the market, which usually about one and a half percent. And when interest rates dropped, they couldn't get that one and a half percent. So they had to find a way to go into the policy and find another way to generate some revenue. And so what they did was, because they couldn't do anything else, because there are very strict limitations on how you can raise more funds for premiums, they looked at mortality experience and tried to claim that mortality experience had increased to the point where they had to increase the cost of insurance and essentially your premium because they were experiencing higher death rates. Well, anybody uh, who has followed the recent uh, uh, times <laughs> well, knows that people are living longer, they're not living less. And even during COVID, we still were doing better than, uh, than losing, uh, we were not losing ground on deaths. So the mortality experience claim was false. And we proved it was false through the use of an actuary. And we proved in this case, Banner versus William Penn, you can see there, we got the, the money back for um, the policyholders. And then if you'll switch to the next slide, we had another company where we did something very similar called US uh, Financial Life, it's called USFL, which is kind of a fun thing to play around with in the case. That was another smaller case, but still 28 million. So you, you, you have to see, nobody ever would have, if you had looked at a client coming to your office with this policy and said, my premium went up and you had and you read the policy, you would think, well, that was, they just did what they could do because these were known as flexible premium adjustable life policies. And they are allowed to increase the premium, but they have to have a good basis for it. And they didn't in these cases and we found it out and we brought these cases and we brought life insurance uh, classes and we were successful in uh, that. That is all for our presentation today. I know we have some questions, Ali. Are you able to read any of those? If we have any questions, we'll take them now. Um, 
Sure. So if you have any questions, you can just input those in the um, Q and A box. We don't have any as of right now, but everyone just feel free to to put those in there, and we'll try to answer as many questions um, as we have time for. Yeah. If you pull up the next slide, Allie, I'll talk about the next seminar. We're going to do another one of these in October, and um, we're going to have different topics. The topics here appear to be the same, but they'll be they'll be um, a lot different and some new faces. Um, and we're going to talk about some of the same things. Um, and I hope that you see that I'm on there and I hope that I'll be able to talk to you about the Blue Cross case at that time uh, in more detail. Uh, maybe maybe there will be some developments in that case that we can discuss on the webinar. Um, and then Lance Gould's gonna talk some more about what Lance, I mean, what uh, James talked about, which was um, commercial litigation and he's involved in a lot of cases um, and, and has some good, good tales to tell you about that. And then we do a lot of ERISA cases and Rebecca, Gilliland, who left us for a while uh, because she had to go to Florida to be with her family. And now she's back with us working remotely from Florida. And we're glad to have her back. But she's sort of an insurance specialist, does a lot of work with ERISA. And uh, we're doing some of those ERISA cases. And then Leon Hampton um, is doing a lot of employment cases with Larry. He's also doing a lot of the key TAM cases with Larry, uh, along with Lauren Miles. And they, the three of them uh, handle all three. I mean, those two um, employment and key TAM cases, and because they work so sort of in tandem, like Larry suggested to you, when you have an employment case, make sure you ask them those questions because uh, almost always those cases come uh, as a result of a, an employment dispute. Very good. We do have a question, um, and this would be great for, for Larry. The question is, how is it determined uh, the percentage of recovery on the key TAM clients, why 15% versus 25%? So Larry, do you want to address that question? Yeah, that, that, that's a simple answer. The statute sets out the perimeters of what's allowable. Um, the statute says if the government does not, I mean, it does intervene, you get a minimum of 15% up to a maximum of 25%. And what where that range, that 15 to 25% really falls, is the judge will determine if the case is successful, how much involvement did the relator have or give in the litigation. On the flip side, obviously, if you have to litigate this privately through your own lawyers, you stand to get 25 to 30%, and it's the same type of scenario. How far did the litigation go? How extensive was it? How much did the relator bring to the table in the litigation? Very good, thank you. Larry, you have um, a couple of cases going on right now. You just tried one key TAM case. You got another one coming up for trial we were involved with yesterday. Um, and I think you have a third one later on in the fall. Is that right? That's right. We got, we got one in August, one in September, and one in October coming up. And we just tried one in February. Yeah, the key TAM cases are very popular. Another question, Allie? We do. So um, the question is for Larry again, has have relator percentages changed much on average in the past few years? No, the, the relator percentages haven't changed as far as that 15 to 25 if the government intervenes and the 25 to 30. What has changed is the penalties and the extensive nature of the fraud. So real quick, the Supreme Court about a year, about two years ago now, issued a ruling that the, for the last 40, 50 years, we have been litigating these cases under the statute and have been told that the statute of limitations has been six years. Well, the Supreme Court clarified a misunderstanding in the statute and said, no, it's really 10 years. So you really have a 10 year window uh, to go back and pursue all the government's damages. So what has really changed is the relators have gotten more money as a result of that expanded window of time that you can go back and make for all claims. Great, Larry. Good. Ellie, I think we're out of time. Yep, the last question, which will wrap us up, is is there still a webinar scheduled for May 18th? There certainly is. You can go to our website to find that um, webinar and register for it. We'll be talking about asbestos litigation. So go to our webpage and it will um, let you register for that webinar as, as well as the ones we have in the future. Thank you all for joining us. Look forward to doing some more of these.